Hello guys and welcome to Vault 13, where we will be exploring various cases of murder, violence and other unsolved crimes. Today's case is the murder in room 1046. This case begins at 1.20pm on January 2nd, 1935 in the Hotel President, a hotel in downtown Kansas City, when a lone man checked into the hotel under the name Ronald T. Owens. The man asked for a room on a high floor of the hotel and was given room 1046. Apart from finding it odd that the man had no luggage, the staff of the hotel thought very little of him. However, this changed very quickly because on January 3rd, the hotel maid, Mary Soptic, stopped by to clean room 1046. Upon entering the room, Mary found it to be in near complete darkness, apart from some light coming from a table lamp in the bedroom. As she cleaned, Owens explained to her that he was expecting a friend to visit and asked her to leave the door unlocked when she was done. Owens then left the room. Four hours later, Mary returned with fresh towels and sheets and found the door was still unlocked. So she entered. Upon doing so, she found that Owens was laying on his bed, fully clothed, seemingly asleep. She then noticed there was a note on the bedside table and read it. The note said, Don, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Wait. Whilst none of these interactions were sinister in nature, they did leave Mary Soptic feeling somewhat uneasy. A feeling that would only worsen the following day. Because on January 4th, Mary once again returned to room 1046 to clean and tidy it. Reaching the door, she found it to be locked from the outside, as it would be when the guest was away, so Mary let herself into the room. As she entered, she found the room to be, as she expected, in complete darkness. But what shocked her was that Owens was inside, sitting in the corner of the room in a chair. Even though she felt increasingly uncomfortable, Mary went about her duties and continued to clean and tidy the room, during which she noted that Owens took a phone call, stating that she heard Owens say, No Don, I don't want to eat, I just had breakfast. He then hung up the phone, and began questioning Mary about her job, about her duties, about the types of guests that stayed at the hotel president, and complaining about the prices of a neighbouring hotel. The question struck Mary as strange because until this time, Owens had said very little to her. However, she answered the questions as best she could, finished her work, and left. As was the case every day, Mary returned in the afternoon with fresh towels and sheets. She discovered the doors be unlocked, knocked on it, announcing she was there with fresh towels. As she waited, she could hear two men talking inside. Eventually, a booming voice came from the room, a voice that was not Owens, telling her to leave as they do not need more towels. It was then on the morning of January 5th that the hotel's bellhop, Randolph Props, received a call from the hotel's operator informing him that the phone in room 1046 had been left off the hook, unused, for some time. Randolph then went to Owen's room, found the door to be locked with a Do Not Disturb sign on the door handle. Despite this, he knocked on the door and was told by Owens, who was inside, to come in. However, due to the fact that the door was locked, Randolph was unable to enter and so instead yelled through the door for Owens to hang up the phone. An hour and a half later, the bellhop received the same call again from the operator, went back to the room, but this time let himself in using the master key, where he discovered Owens to be laying on his bed, naked, in a seemingly drunken state. Not wanting to deal with a naked drunken guest, Randolph hung up the phone himself and left the room to return to his desk. An hour later, he received yet again, for a third time, the same call from the operator. Returning to the room once again and letting himself in, Randolph was this time met with a very gruesome scene. Towels, sheets and the wall were spattered and covered in blood and Ronald T. Owens was curled up in the corner of the room, also covered in blood. The police were called and quickly arrived, bringing with them a man named Dr. Flanders who examined Owens and concluded that he had been a victim of torture. His arms, legs and neck had been restrained with cords. He had a punctured lung, a fractured skull 
and stab wounds to his chest. When Dr. Flanders asked Owens who did this to him, he responded, nobody. When asked how he got his injuries, Owens responded, I fell against the bathtub. Owens would then slip into unconsciousness and was taken to hospital where, due to his severe injuries, he would die. As the investigation got underway, it was discovered that all of Owens' clothes were missing and that any object from the room that could have been used as a murder weapon were also missing. It was also concluded that Owen's injuries were inflicted upon him long before the bellhop's first visit to the room, with the assumption being made that he was keeping the phone off the hook in an effort to ask for help. Help which, sadly, came too late. But, most surprisingly to police, was the discovery that Ronald T. Owens was not in fact this man's real name, and that nobody of that name at this point was registering as living anywhere in the United States. At this point, the police reached out to the general public for help and information, some of which came from other guests of the hotel. One of these guests was a woman named Jean Owens, of no relation, who had been staying in room 1048, next door to room 1046. Jean claimed to have heard on the night of January 4th a commotion coming from Ronald T. Owens' room, during which she heard the voices of men and women shouting and cursing. Despite the noise, Jean decided against contacting the front desk to complain. The neighbouring hotel which Owens had complained about, the Hotel Muleback, also came forward to inform police that a man matching Ronald T. Owens' description had stayed with them on January 1st for one night, but he checked in under the name Eugene K. Scott another name not registered to anyone in the United States, leading the police to another dead end. It was then, a few months after the murder, that the body of the man still being named Ronald T. Owens was organised to be buried, at which point, to the surprise of the investigators, they received a donation to cover the cost of the funeral. The donation came with a letter that read, Love Forever, Lucille. The donator, or the person named in the letter, were never identified. It was then in 1936, a year after the murder, that a woman named Ruby Ogletree came forward to police to claim that Ronald T. Owens was in fact her missing son. He was 17 years old, and his real name was Artemis Ogletree. Despite no real evidence to support this claim, the police were inclined to believe her. And so come the theories as to who was responsible for the death of a 17-year-old boy living under false identities. The simplest theory is that the man named Don, whom Owens or Ogletree had named on two separate occasions, had carried out the murder for unknown reasons and had acted entirely alone. An extension of this theory is that Don was working with a woman believed to be a cool girl and together they'd carried out the murder. Some people also believe that Ogletree had in fact been cheating on an unidentified girlfriend with this escort and that she had been tracked down by Don who was either the father or the brother of the unidentified girlfriend who then paid the escort to assist him in locating and murdering Artemis Ogletree in an act of revenge. Another theory is that Artemis Ogletree was in fact involved in the murky illegal world of mob organised boxing matches. Some evidence to support this are that Ogletree had a cauliflower ear and was reported to have looked to work as a wrestler, showing at the very least a fighting background. It is then believed that Artemis Ogletree had crossed the mob in some way, most likely financially, and had set himself up as a marked man. However, this does not easily explain the letter and phone call to and from Don respectively, but it is speculated that Don was in fact referring to a Mafia boss, or a Mafia Don, towards whom Artemis Ogletree had been acting defiantly. However, despite ongoing interest in the case and the passing decades, the murder of Artemis Ogletree in room 1046 still remains unsolved.